Hello everybody. Welcome to Slevarna stage. I'm very happy that you are still here with us. Uh, the program is following. We have some changes, so we excuse for that, but sometimes, yeah. you know, you can just, you can't predict. Maybe no, it was already on predict matter. We will see, but doesn't matter right now. There is a time for next talk, and our next speaker will be Amin Rafi. I mean, uh, uh, he, he is a biohacker, consultant, journalist, designer, advisor, and co-founder, always looking to demonstrate the higher possibilities uh, related to not just Bitcoin network, but also co concepts of decentralization and privacy. He's currently working with the 1MM5 project, a protocol seeking to provide anonymous answers at communication by routing messages and communication through the Tor, I2P, and meshing networks. Uh, he's a regular speaker around the world. You can meet him in Europe, also in Australia. And you got into the blockchain in 2013. That's yes. Right. Okay, so we have early adapters. So, I mean, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. Uh, this year makes my fifth year at the Hackers Congress. Uh, yeah, half a decade. <laughs> <laughs> It's really an honor to be able to keep coming here. Uh, what happens is that every year before the Hackers Congress, I start losing faith and start getting a bit cloudy in my thoughts and whether the direction I'm going in is the correct path. Though I really do appreciate having an environment like this that boosts that energy up again and resets your system. So my name is Amin Rafi. Uh, last year, I kind of started with a term blockchain therapist because I felt like more people needed a therapist than a blockchain. So I've just adopted the name for myself for fun. Um, yeah, I thought it was funny too. Oh. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter, EV0K3D. Uh, I would love to get in touch with you, learn about what you're doing in your project, your organization, uh, any other areas that may be of interest. I have been involved since 2013. I work with decentralized projects uh, in various uh, sectors of this space, whether it's uh, cloud storage, whether it's communication, lending, and other areas. Uh, at the moment, I have moved to Mexico. So I'm living in Oaxaca uh, in Mexico. It's a beautiful city. The reason I moved there is because I feel that a lot of these technologies are very useful in emerging markets. So I lived in Netherlands. I grew up in Australia. I'm originally from Iran. I lived in Berlin. I've lived in Cyprus. And now I'm in Mexico. This allows me to have a holistic view on what is going on, at least to a sector of the world. Uh, combining the experience and the knowledge of what is going on in these countries allows me to have an oversight and understanding of what tools are necessary and which will have the greater impact. Uh, so I will give you some insight into those as we move forward. Uh, and the talk will be presented in three stages, which is what I want to see, which is what we want to see into the future, the limitations that are holding us back from getting there, and also how do we overcome these limitations. So let's start the journey. This is a video which I found quite funny. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I like to always start with a little video. Um, just have to swap the audio, if you don't mind pausing for a second. Do you mind dimming the light? Perfect. I am dying out here. How much? One dollar worth of lemon coin, which is approximately a thousand lemon coins. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Get that centralized currency out of my face. This is 2018. I only accept cryptocurrency here, preferably lemon coin. I don't have whatever a lemon coin is. Well, a lemon coin's my utility token. It doesn't have a lot of utility yet, but we're working on it. One day it might go to a dollar. <laughs> cool.
Cool. I don't have lemon coin. Fine. I'll also take Bitcoin or Doge. I'm sorry, buddy. I'll come back for you someday. <laughs> what? You, you need like 200 of those. How much is one Doge even worth? One Doge always equals one Doge. Okay, fine. How do I get lemon coin? Why is this so difficult? I can sense your frustration. Think about it. It's the future of business. A trustless system without third parties. So to get lemon coin, I just need you to create an account on this third party exchange. I'm going to need your passport, bank info, social security <laughs> number, and a selfie with today's date. I thought you said this was a trustless system. Oh, it is as soon as the exchange trusts you. You, you could trust us. We are the number one crypto exchange in all of Krash Krako Krashimia. I don't think that's a real country. Look, Kremlin. You can make this in Croatia. Easy transaction if you just follow the protocol. Okay? Okay. Smile. Say K Y C. Okay, so this will take uh, three to five days to process. Uh, after that, when you are approved, uh, you would probably not be notified. So check back in uh, a week or so. This is ridiculous. You're telling me that if anybody wants to buy lemonade, they need to go through this process? Yeah, I'm telling you, this is the future of business. I've already got like a dozen customers. <laughs> lemonade, please. Congratulations. Your account is verified, funds deposited. You have a private key. The key number is 0X225D998569. It's just my favorite number. Like C47D19299R. Now, if you forget this private code, do not... Anyway. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's always good to have a laugh, right? So moving forward. So there are limitations, uh, but the future is bright. So we all want to see a future where things are decentralized, where things are transparent. But how do we get there? There are many obstacles along the way because we have been living in a very centralized society. This society is void of accountability. A lot of the things that occur, whether it's in organizations like, such as the UN, IMF, banking institutions, or your regular business institutions, there is limitations in how accountability is measured. So decentralized systems allow people to overcome that to a certain degree. Uh, while this is great, we do have to pay attention to what is hindering our progress. So to look at those aspects, we have to first understand where it is that we want to reach. So these are some of the goals that I believe are quite important, such as the ability to have control of your identity, such as the ability to have control over your money, be your own bank. Other aspects include the freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, freedom of collaboration, freedom of association. And you can see other pointers there. These are great. These are things that we can aim for. Though, depending on what organization you're working with, some of these may not be of priority of importance. So then we have to modify them based on the task that we need to uh, complete or the project that we are trying to bring to the surface. So limitations exist currently based on that video that you see, usability, the ability to adopt uh, new users, the ability to use applications that are currently existing on a wide array and an all-encompassing knowledge to be able to navigate through these very difficult applications. And as it moves forward, we have other aspects, which is the decision-making. So to give you some examples, we have custodial versus non-custodial. This is a great example for me. Most people nowadays, when they say, well, let's buy cryptocurrencies, it's no longer the era where we go and purchase them from people. Those times have changed. I've been around since 2013, some of you longer, some of you shorter. The history has changed. We have gone from a point where we used to purchase cryptocurrencies peer-to-peer -peer through IRC, through chat groups. This is how I did it. And times changed to now average user will go to Coinbase and these very centralized organizations. 
Uh, whether this is the wrong way to go about it or not is a personal decision. For me, it's not the way I like to do it, though there are risks and uh, benefits with each choice, with each avenue that you travel down. So I'll give you some examples. So I was working with a project and I was requested to review the white paper from a technical aspect, reviewing how blockchain is implemented within this project. Funnily enough, all aspects of it was quite sound, though the blockchain aspect, in specific Ethereum blockchain, uh, was implemented in a way that I would be worried that the project did not have a sound understanding of how these things work. So there is limitation in knowledge. Uh, there was a Deloitte, for example, research that indicated many people thought they knew how a blockchain works, how these systems work. And the more people pretend to know, the more damage it causes to the entire ecosystem. And then we have to pay the price for it. So a very common thing that I get asked is like, oh, Bitcoin is not safe. Many people have lost money. And I have to reassure people that it is not Bitcoin which is unsafe. It is the users that have built services on top of uh, Bitcoin and, this, and other cryptocurrencies. So for example, in Japan, uh, which was one of the highest uh, rated in percentage-wise of Bitcoin in 2017, I believe. Uh, and then it, it went something from like 40 or 50% of all Bitcoin purchases were done in Japanese yen to currently about 6 to 7%. That's a huge difference. So when we say volatility, we also have to take into account all these events that have occurred that have allowed individuals to have the notion that there is something wrong with it. And they are right in their way. Though, again, it's not the network. The network has been operating flawlessly. So these services, for example, in Japan, an exchange got hacked. NEM tokens, half a billion dollars worth, were hacked. They were warned previous to this that there is a security uh, issue with the way that their exchange had been set up though they didn't take into consideration that warning. And as a result, half a billion dollars were stolen. And imagine how many people were impacted by that. Imagine how many individuals walked away going, well, this technology sucks. Half a billion dollars is a significant amount of money. So in turn, we have a responsibility to ensure that the systems that we design are tested thoroughly. Many people are eager to introduce their projects or their uh, applications to the market without doing their due diligence and making sure that it's uh, void of errors, or at least doing a group testing to overcome this. So there's very simple methods that you can use to overcome these kind of issues. Other aspects is wallets. So for example, in Mexico, I wanted to get a store to accept Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and such. And I went through a list of wallets. I went through about five or six. Some were closed source, though they worked quite well. I'm not a supporter of closed source software unless it really works really well, like Photoshop, for example. I don't have an open source alternative which can match the uh, functionality that Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator provide. So with wallets, we have many, many different types. The issue is, as said by um, the book Skin in the Game, we have tools that are built by people who don't use the tools. An example which was used in the book was that the train or the subway within New York was redesigned. It originally had a bit of a lip, you could say, that people could place their coffee cups on. After the redesign, this was put at a slant. A designer thought this might look better. An industrial designer, which is my background, would understand that you need to go for a ride on this train. You need to understand how people are existing, how people uh, behave on that specific mode of commute. So after the redesign, you could no longer place your coffee cup there. It's a very small issue, though it occurs, because you have someone that designed it that does not take the train, that did not understand the benefit of having that space to place your coffee cup. Uh, with the wallets, the same thing occurred. So when I asked the store owner to uh, accept it, he's like, which wallet? So I had to go through it. I had to test them. As an end user and as a designer, I go through it and go, all right, there's limitations within some. Some, for example, if the store owner requests 20 pesos, I send that amount. 
There's no message, you know, something very simple like, oh, this amount has been received, which the store owner can then feel good about. These are new users. They are afraid. And if there's no message, they can be like, well, what happened now? And saying, oh, well, go to balance. Oh, I know it's grayed out right now, and the amount doesn't show, but if you wait like 45 minutes and then check it again, it's going to be great. Um, but that's not very user-friendly, is it? He's going to be like, or she's going to be like, uh, well, I don't know. The balance doesn't show up. What do you mean confirmation? And then you go into down these paths. You can avoid that whole conversation by having an application that simply pops up and says, hey, amount received. An application, for example, that I used was not designed for landscape mode. Most of the wallets that I tried were not. The only one I could get to use was Coinomy. So that limitation also existed that a store owner may use a tablet and it might be in landscape mode. So how do we overcome these challenges? Is by taking into account the people that are using it. It's 2019 and we still don't have functional applications that are up to par with the needs that they are trying to meet. So I'm trying to find loopholes and I'm trying to find these limitations that are slowing down the progress of cryptocurrency adoption, cryptocurrency awareness, knowledge, safety, and the ability for people to feel comfortable using them. And very simple tweaks can challenge these or meet these challenges. Uh, so in Cyprus, for example, uh, they have a large community with cryptocurrencies, in Nicosia in specific. And uh, I was requested by an organization, and I thought it was quite funny, and this is like from a corporate perspective. Uh, an email was sent out to a bunch of uh, crypto-related people after they saw us, I guess, giving a presentation there. And the email was like, oh, you know, we are this huge telecommunication company. We would like to invite you for lunch um, to help us come up with some blockchain solutions and get your opinions, and we'll give you free lunch. I was like, OK, that's interesting. So I looked into their uh, history. In 2016, they had made over $60 million in profit. So I sent an email back going, I'm a bit surprised that you have not allowed the individuals who are participating in this to be rewarded for their time you had just offered free lunch. Even a food research survey gives you something. So that gap again needs to be filled where individuals are rewarded for their knowledge. And uh, I found it quite insulting, to say the least. Uh, Mexico. So in Mexico, a lot of card payments are done through a third party. And they collect 4% on every transaction. So this, again, is an opportunity uh, for you to bring up cryptocurrencies. But it needs to be done in the whole process. So for example, in a city called San Cristobal, a individual had come to this store and said, can you please accept Dash? And after some conversation, the store owner agreed. Though he had just shown him how to download the wallet. No other process in place. By the time I got to him and saw it, it was worth one-tenth of what it was originally. It was a very small amount, though it leaves a bad impression on the end user or the store owner. Because the person was just fanatic about it, except Dash. But OK, what about the rest of the process? So when I went to him, I said, here's an exchange called Bitso. Bitso is a large exchange in Mexico. It allows you to deposit Bitcoin and then transfer it to your bank account using SEPA. And after I showed him, he was very excited because I kept coming back and like, you know, paying for things with Bitcoin. And uh, he could just transfer it straight away to his bank account. He was so excited to be able to do the whole process. And those are the kind of very small things that we can do to overcome such challenges. Just being aware that the end user may not just want to use it to save. That for them, it's a form of currency. That for them, they need to put it into their bank account so they can pay for things. Very simple things. So the damage of not knowing and the damage of not taking your time to understand the ecosystem is quite profound in many ways. And these little bits and pieces can add up to lead to a place where we are no longer uh, aware and there's a lot of issues and bad negative thoughts towards cryptocurrencies. So that's with the personal case. And business cases, you need to understand which currencies to use. I don't try and push one. Usually, you know, I say to use Bitcoin for the sake that I know it's the longest running one. I wouldn't suggest another one unless I felt very comfortable. Or that you let the store owner know of other options and let them decide on top of that. Moving forward. 
other limitations exist within software. So there's software which is open source or there's software which is closed source. And this is a very important part of this ecosystem. And uh, if you look at it, the main difference is either you uh, control the software or the software controls you. And that's a very simple way to put it. Cryptology is using persuasive, uh, a method of persuasive, uh, sorry, persuasive methods within technology. So the, these are the way that a closed source application, such as Facebook, such as Instagram, such as uh, Twitter, get paid. If something is free, it comes out of somewhere. So I would much rather, as a user, pay for an application, knowing that it's not tracking me, knowing that I have some sort of a control, rather than to do something that's free, which is taking all my data and selling it to third parties that I have no control over. So in the same manner, a lot of the knowledge that we have is because the universe is not closed source. Our DNA is able to be read. So we can look at our genome code. We can look at a lot of structures within nature and study them. It is because of these things that we are able to progress and reach the stages that we have. So having something be open source allows others to also learn from it. So I see a lot of cryptocurrency projects that are aiming to patent it. And that's OK if you have the right reasoning. Though we, ha we exist in an ecosystem that having it open allows others to also have an input. It's not so much about having it open. So the more important aspect is allowing others to contribute to it. If you have a project and you open source, you make it open source, others around the world can also review the code, they can add to it, they can modify it and use it in ways that you may have never thought about. It adds to your adoption, it adds to your application. So, no worries. So the best way to kind of achieve this is to remain fluid. And to remain fluid, you need to be able to create an application that can morph and can change. That if at a certain time, a new regulation comes out, it can morph with it and move with it. And these are very, very important things. No worries. We can skip it. It's a video of Bruce Lee saying, be water, my friend. I'm sure you've all kind of seen it. It's quite old. But he has a point. When you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. And in the same manner, these applications need to be able to morph to the environment that they are going into. They need to be able to shift. They need to be able to uh, you know, uh, change with time. So looking at these kind of issues and having that vision where I want to reach a point where we have decentralization, we have transparency, we have accountability, and looking at the issues that are limiting our ability to reach there, we then look at tools. So the topic of this conference or the event is opt out. So for us to opt out, we need tools. A lot of these tools remain in beta stage, some in alpha, some are being developed and not even released to the public. So the issue there is that we need to find and support projects that are aligned with the future vision. So I've been scanning for six years now. Bitcoin is great. It has issues, in my opinion. Some of these issues is that it requires outside investors to fund the developers. So because of this, I'm not questioning the integrity of the people funding it. I'm just merely saying that by doing so, you're introducing a centralized point of access to that project. That someone with the fund could have an ulterior motive. That it could lose the integrity that was set in motion upon its release. So looking at these projects, I found Decred. And I quite like Decred. Why? First of all, it was a project that, from the start, put a decentralized governance system within itself. Secondly, it put a decentralized funding system. So why is this important? It's important because if you have a project which is self-funded, and you have a governance system, external influence becomes very limited. The goals and integrity remain much more secure. 
So Decred works in the way that it's 60, 30, 10. 60% 60 of the uh, currencies go to the miners. 30% goes to the stakeholders, and 10% goes uh, to the decentralized funding, which then, as a community, they can vote on how that fund is being used. So imagine if that was the case with Bitcoin. Imagine 10% of all Bitcoins that were mined went into a decentralized fund to pay for development, to pay for marketing, to pay for uh, whatever else, traveling, mar uh, events, and budgets and such. Wouldn't that change the entire scope? Then we wouldn't need to rely on third parties. And it would very much secure the decentralized aspect. A decentralized tool should be exactly that, decentralized. Other aspects which I find quite interesting is that they built their own decentralized exchange. They were the first ones to do an atomic swap. And it was launched in 2016. So it's fairly new, but it's a project that I find quite uh, interesting. So the governance system is at its heart. It is a very, very powerful system. It allows people to submit proposals. It allows people to vote on consensus changes. And what happens is that you as an individual can go into the system called Politia and submit a proposal. So let's say you have an idea. You can just go on there and be like, this is my business plan. This is how much it costs. This is what I intend to do. These are my experiences. And this is what I expect to get out of it. You could be anywhere in the world. If you have the integrity, you have the knowledge, you have the capability to do so, you can use the system to raise your funds to do it. If you hold Decred, you also get a thing that they refer to as a ticket, which allows you to vote on such things um, and have a say. So overall, you can see the benefits of having an internal governance system, having an internal funding system that allows individuals to incorporate ideas and launch projects without needing to rely on third parties, without needing to rely on external in, uh, investors. Recently, they also introduced a privacy protocol based on coin shuffle. It's a very simple method that they implemented, uh, and the code base is very, very short, so less things can break. It's much more secure. It allows people that buy the tickets. So right now you need about, I think, 120. It averages between 120 or 130 decreds that you need to have a ticket. And by having a ticket, you're rewarded. So after you submit your opinion or vote on the matter or even uh, handle it through a pool, you get your amount back and you get a bit on top of it. At the same time, with this privacy method, those who purchase tickets can remain anonymous. Because imagine as a stakeholder, you get tracked down. Opinions can then be manipulated. So allowing people to purchase tickets in a way that keeps them private introduces another level of integrity to the decentralized governance and funding system. And you must protect that. And later, after testing, they may introduce the same thing to transactions. But first, testing needs to be done. And that's very important. Again, you need to test systems. 1M5 is a mission and a project that I'm personally a part of. 1M5 works with I2P and Tor to relay messages to bypass censorship in countries such as China, Iran, Israel, North Korea, even other countries which we believe are open, United States, Australia, New Zealand. For example, in Australia, they introduced a law requesting a backdoor into encryption. You can no longer call it encryption if you have a backdoor. So that started a lot of controversy. So we're heading towards a path where applications are being modified to remove the very protection that people fought very hard to have. Through this project, hoping to overcome that, hoping to allow people to be able to relay messages without the fear of censorship, without the fear of being tracked down. So imagine you're a journalist in a country where speaking out can cost you your life. But then how do you do that while having some sort of a identity attached to it and allowing the message to be relayed without you being put out harm's way? So by using such systems, relaying messages through I2P, Sorry, just so I gauge it, like put your hand up if you know what I2P is. All right. 
It's less than half, about 20%, let's say, 20, 30%. So I2P is a decentralized network. Uh, the difference with Tor is that I2P is closed from the clearnet. It requires proxy access, which means that you can't really shut it down. Uh, it is very powerful in being able to relay messages. So you can incorporate this system uh, within uh, the 1M5 protocol within messaging applications, within email applications. You can incorporate it within uh, blockchain wallets to be able to relay transactions without it being stopped. It is very powerful for journalists. It is very powerful for organizations that want to keep their uh, communications secure and away from hackers. This is how it could be used in a messaging application. The beautiful thing about this is that if you look at the Hong Kong protest that recently occurred, Telegram servers were DDoS and they were shut down. That was the main method of communication. Because we have centralization, it means that organizations can get shut down. And whether that means through force of government or it means through force of DDoSing, these issues occur, which means people cannot communicate, they can't organize. So allowing messages to be relayed in a way that bypasses normal uh, centralized servers is very, very important. Telegram was a good step forward from applications like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, but we need better tools. We need tools that allow individuals to communicate without fear of these applications being shut down, especially in countries like China where Tor servers are almost all blocked. So, Having a way to go around that is quite important. It is being incorporated within a project called Encrypt. Encrypt is out of Harvard Business School. It aims to produce this as a way for journalists, uh, organizations to relay messages and store files and other sort of information in a secure way. And that is a powerful thing, to, in, especially in today's age, where such freedoms are being restricted more and more on a daily basis. It is a donation-based project. We don't receive, it's, you know, once you register something somewhere and you get a bank account, you can very easily be tracked down. You can, you can easily be shut down. So allowing it to be donation-based, such as the decentralized exchange, BISC, which is used for uh, Bitcoin, in the same manner that's a decentralized autonomous organization. 1M5 remains as a decentralized autonomous mission, which means that it is out of physical jurisdiction. It exists purely on the digital realm. If you are a developer, if you are a person with access to or the ability to be able to contribute somehow, please look it up. If you like it, that would be really great. I do have a little bit more spare time, so I do want to talk about some of the experiences I've had in Mexico. How many of you know about the Zapatista movement? Less than I2P. The Zapatista movement remains as one of the most successful anarchist movements in recent history. It started in 1994 as a way to protect the indigenous culture within a state called Chiapas. Since then, it has grown to include between 150,000 to 300,000 individuals who are looking to protect their way of life because the way things were going, the Mayan culture and language was being eradicated, or at least not protected. So they stood up, and they stood up against uh, military movements of Mexico. A lot of them sacrificed their own lives, or it was taken from them in a gruesome manner. But eventually they were able to take control of their zone. So it is an absolute autonomous zone, which means they have nothing to do with the Mexican government in any form or way when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to hospital, when it comes to uh, education, when it comes to uh, funding, electricity, all of it. And it is a very amazing movement to experience. So when you're in a city like San Cristobal, you can go there and feel the energy of it. You can go to stores and buy products that support them. So they produce coffee, honey, chocolate, tobacco, and many other things to support themselves. They turn over millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Their economy within itself is independent, and that is very, very powerful. Yet 
very few people he knew about it. And that's something that I find interesting. Because this is a very successful model, yet not many people know about it. So I wanted to learn more. So I went and visited a university, which Noam Chomsky, um, I'm sure all of you know who Noam Chomsky is, uh, reg regarded it as one of the most uh, holistic universities. So I wanted to know for myself what it's like, so I went and visited it. I wanted to know what they have to offer. And upon walking in, very friendly people, no electricity from outside. They have their own huge generator within the organization or within the space that they have. Indigenous kids can go and learn skills. So the skills vary. You walk through the place, there's beautiful music being played. You don't feel like you're in a university, or at least the ones that I'm used to. It's very colorful, it's very fun. So you walk into one room and people are learning how to play guitar, learning about music. Another room, they're learning how to make shoes. Another uh, aspect of it is that they have trucks lined up and you can go and learn how to be a mechanic. You can go and learn uh, how to use uh, tools to build fabric or learn about electrical equipment. It's very, very uh, application-based. Woodwork, for example, metalwork. It was very eye-opening for me. Imagine all these individuals go out, they can always feed themselves somehow, right? You're given the tools to be able to enter labor work on one form or another. That is very, very valuable. Imagine you come from a place where you don't even speak Spanish. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. I found it really interesting that there was areas where people would be speaking, and I'm like, that's not Spanish. What language is that? And they would be speaking Mayan. So this caters to that that group of people. It allows them to continue existing in their own traditional way without having to adopt a language or a way of life that was forced on them. It allows them to preserve those aspects that are very important for them. This is uh, the guy in San Cristobal that I had a chat to and got him to accept Bitcoin and I gave him a pin to cheer him up. He liked it. Um, yeah, and then he, he made this sign himself I thought it was very sweet, but I thought to help him out, so I redesigned it for him to make it a bit more user-friendly. And it also allows people to donate without having to communicate with him. So that was an important aspect. So this wasn't so much for payment, because payments would be done through his phone. I put the QR codes there, so if someone is eating, they can just tip him without needing to communicate. And that was an extra benefit for me. So the Zapatista movement, being in Mexico, really opened my eyes to how these tools can work. So these systems, for example, with Decred, individuals in these countries can come up with ways that they can transform their monetary system. So unlike Europe, which is pushing to be uh, cashless, Mexico operates 50%, if not more, of Mexico operates on cash. And that is beautiful, because you're dealing with an economy that understands the risks of banks. It is the distrust that they have towards the financial system that pushes them to use cash and not put it in a banking institution. On the other aspects, due to poverty and low income, a lot of, it, a lot of the individuals uh, do not find it beneficial to put it in a bank account that takes fees that may be greater than what they have. So store of value is quite important. So there was a research done by a organization, and a friend of mine is a part of it, and they published it, and they saw that store of value was quite an important thing in such a region, as it should be anywhere in the world, really, because you are at the mercy of the financial system. And in 2008, we saw how that could jeopardize individuals' lives and ability to have control over their uh, financial uh, safety. So, store of value is very important globally. Uh, being able to have being able to have a system that allows you to take currency away from the normal uh, financial central bank, bank backed systems is of great value. So showing individuals and educating them on such topics is of importance. Uh, other things that I noticed is that in uh, Mexico, because of these things, people are also very weary of new tools. So not, all they, not only are they weary of the financial system, but also if you come up and say, well, here's a new system and it's decentralized. So I'll give you an example, for exa uh, I'll give you an example in relation to San Cristobal. 
I went and spent multiple hours speaking to this guy. I showed him the different ways on how you can accept cryptocurrency, the benefits to him for him, and how you can change it to cash. Afterwards, he said, well, what are you getting out of this? I go, that's the old mentality. I'm not getting anything out of this. I just spent five hours with you. I went and paid for the signs to be printed. I did all of this because I want to show you that there's another way. What I get out of it is the happiness to know that you are now an individual that has access to a system that was not designed by a central bank. And that was a very uh, reflective moment for me, that we live in such a world where, e even in Netherlands, I had the same experience. The individual thought, oh, well, we, you know, it's, it's always the thought, what are you getting out of this? And I think decentralization and the culture that comes with such organizations, such as Parallel Police, such as crypto anarchists, such as individuals who are pushing to change the realm that we're kind of in, has brought about a new notion, which is community-based, which is the strength in numbers, which was the original motto of Bitcoin, right? Strength in numbers. And the more people we bring along and show how to overcome those limitations, the quicker we can reach that vision that I put up at the start. And by fixing and tweaking these things, whether it's in your project, by looking at how blockchain is being used, whether it's necessary, whether it's being applied in the right manner, and the data that is being collected. So that white paper, for example, mentioned nothing about the metadata being collected, about the individual's safety, about the individual's uh, obligation, the organization's obligation. It was the first time after five or six years of dealing with such projects that I entered, a, entered another version of it, which was very centralized. I couldn't believe how much time I wasted dealing with an organization that was so centralized compared to all the other projects that I worked with, which things get done very quickly in a decentralized manner because you assign tasks and make sure that people get it done. And in a centralized manner, it's like you interview and then go speak to the CTO and then go speak to the CEO and then they have to be like, oh, how do we know what you're saying is right? When an individual thinks they know what's going on, so a project, for example, I had many issues with because the founder had read two books on blockchain, and he designed the system, or thought, or thought that he could. And I don't mean to like put him down, that's great. You know, you felt comfortable and confident to do so. But that puts you at risk, your users at risk, the project at risk, and also the individuals. You have your obligation to make sure you assign that to someone that knows what they're doing. And that is the problem with both a startup or a founder having, wanting to have control over it, and being able to, in some ways, delegate that task to someone that knows it better. So those are some of my experiences. And I guess, overall, I want us to work on these issues so we can reach the future vision. I want us to understand our obligation and responsibilities a bit better. And be able to work with organizations to help them implement these within their projects and overcome uh, whatever issues or limitations they have. So thank you for coming here. It's been a great honor to speak here for half a decade. And uh, I just want to say that, it sounded cool. Um, and uh, I've always loved coming to Paralini Place, and I hope to continue coming, because it's one of the only places in the world, honestly, that I've been to that still portrays the true principles of what all of this meant to begin with. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Amin, for sharing with us. And we have, mm, I think we have five minutes, so we can do two questions. Ah, I see already one. Oh, sorry, guys. I just want to thank you for coming every year. It's my third year here. It's your third year here. I, part of the reason why I come back is because of you. Uh, <laughs> first year, <laughs> I remember there were ice baths and microdosing and all kinds of different things. Second year was you know, more open in this third year. What do you think the next few years will bring? And I'm not just talking crypto here. I'm talking just freedom and liberty. What do you think the next few years will bring? What are you going to talk about next year? Yeah. Yeah, the tough one. No, no, it's a good one. And a tough one. I guess at the moment, in relation to the previous years where I came, I had been exploring biohacking. So I had done a seven-day fast, for example, water fast. During that time, while I was away in Cyprus, I tried a 48-hour dry fast, so no food or water. That was interesting. Um, upon, on top of that, you know, I did the cold training, so sitting in a frozen lake. 
I live in Mexico now, so it's kind of hard, but I do my best. And uh, I'm working with the rings. This sounds weird, but my aim for the next uh, three or four months, I've been working on it for nearly a year, is to do the Iron Cross on the rings. It's just pushing my own boundaries. And by doing so, it allows me to have a greater scope on life itself. Um, I'm very close to being able to do that. In terms of liberty, in terms of technology, it's changing. We all know it's changing. The culture has changed drastically. Uh, many of the aspects of it is no longer representative of the original ideas. And that's okay. Things change, right? And we have to be able to be okay with it and move with it. So even for myself, I deal with a lot of hardship in that way where I'm trying to figure out how to move with it. So I think a friend of mine said that most of the, for example, privacy-based coins are being delisted off exchanges. So this is occurring globally. It is being put into the dark space, you know? So by doing so, you're also forcing all these currencies to go into the uh, darknet, let's say. The application of them become more prominent in such a way. On the other side, it also pushes for people to bring about more decentralized forms of uh, exchange and distribution. So a greater push for decentralized exchanges and a greater push for decentralized systems that can't be shut down. Like, for example, BISC, again, is a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO. It allows people to trade Bitcoin for Amazon cards or, you know, the whole scope of things that local Bitcoin uh, does, but in a decentralized way, in a way that doesn't give away your uh, information, your identity and all of that. So I see two very powerful sides. One is that the corporations have indeed taken over the scene and they refer to it as distributed ledger technology and it's become a marketing tool that's embedded within so many applications that very rarely need them. Um, a lot of people don't understand that when you make it private blockchain, you lose a lot of the powers that were given to you. It just, it's absurd in many ways and I'm not even interested in them. Um, on the other side, there's a huge movement of sharing economy. There's a huge movement of decentralization. And I think that's kind of opposing it. And I think that will be the battle. And uh, I don't know, we'll see. I'll give you an example. In Australia, there's a group of people who through Snapchat started distributing uh, information news. It now has two million members. And news networks are getting very worried. And police have come out and said, leave this to us. Leave it to the professionals. Stay out of this. But you can't compete with two million people relaying news, you know, and giving photos and opinions. And like, that, that, that for me is so disruptive that I love it. Um, so yeah, that's just a few examples of my thoughts. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thanks Thank for coming, Elder. Yes. Um, just, just a quick question. So, um, and thanks for the, for the talk. What's your definition of decentralization? I Where think there's a lot of confusion in the space. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> so, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that. On what? Again, the, your, your definition of decentralization. My definition of decentralization, we, we, we're like as an organization, as an application. No. H how do you just define the term philosophically ah. decentralization? Uh, what, what does it mean to you? Because you've clearly talked about that a lot. Sure, sure. For me... Oh, and Amir, we have one minute, okay? So... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For me, it's the ability to have people voice their opinions. It's the ability to have transparency in the way that, as an organization or application, uh, decisions are made. How people collaborate, how individuals uh, produce results. The best example I can give you is nature. Nature itself is decentralized. Your entire body is decentralized. The way your cells and everything else functions in your body is in a very decentralized way. So it is representative of nature, and anything that is not representative of nature will require third-party input. So it's like your blood cells, for example, requesting access from someone that's not in your body and what they should do. Such a thing doesn't occur. Um, so for me, it's that autonomy, uh, representation of nature, is the best way I can put it. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank so you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for staying with us. And definitely, if you want to find find out more, catch him on a bar or somewhere around the place. Yep. And uh, we will follow in 10 minutes. Uh, Josef Tietek will be the next presenter here.